Welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door. This is Zev Ash, and it's my pleasure to welcome Oren Greenberg to the podcast. Oren, in about a minute or so, please introduce yourself. Sure. I'm a marketing consultant. I run a marketing consultancy. I tend to work with funded scale-ups and large corporates, like Lenovo, Investec Bank, and Canon, you know, some of the known culprits. Been doing this for a long time, over 20 years. Um, invested in a few businesses. Some have done well, some less well. And that's it. Pretty straightforward. And the best way to find out more about me is to check out my LinkedIn profile. Okay, perfect. And all that, you know, the all your LinkedIn profile and other information will be included in my show notes, of course. So um Usually I, I start to peel the onion by going back to my guest childhood, but in your case, uh, everything is so open. So I'm just going to start by reading a quote from your profile. Um, I began my entrepreneurial journey at 10 years old, selling glow-in-the-dark yo-yos to neighborhood kids. 15 years later, I was ranking business businesses number one for payday loans, bingo, and a myriad of competitive terms on Google. Um, were your parents entrepreneurs? Uh, my father was an entrepreneurial. Yeah, he opened his own business. They were very encouraging to pursue their entrepreneurial journey. I think they believe it's a, a superior alternative to conventional work. I guess that's probably before they found out there's engineers at Google that make a million dollars a year plus. You know? So they probably didn't have that notion back in their day of what the possibilities are in tech. Yeah, but well, you can work for Google, but you're still employed. You're not self-employed. So the, the each is... A, yeah, it's a question around like, you know, what is the the benefits of being an entrepreneur? Is it identity? Is it status? Is it freedom? And it's interesting. Different people have different motivations but I think like people, from what I've understood, people want to have freedom with their schedule. They want to have autonomy and they want to have impact. And those three things they feel are, are more probable if they're running their own business. It's interesting. When I do a workshop on, on entrepreneurship, um, the, the, I ask people, why are you looking into it? And if the answer is, I want to make a lot of money, typically I will tell them, uh, and I'm not as experienced as you are, but I've worked with entrepreneurs my entire career. I typically will tell them if that's your goal is to be rich and to make money, then save yourself a lot of heartache. It's not going to work. Uh, that can't be the drive behind being an entrepreneur. So leading into that from, from your yo-yo days, um, it's interesting because anyone that we read about who is an entrepreneur, uh, the successful ones and the not successful ones, everyone started selling lemonade in a lemonade stage, selling papers door to door. One of my guests last week said he cleaned his neighbor's yards to save $30 to buy one share of Disney. So this goes back a while back. But yet, so everybody's got the same beginning, so to speak. But it, But when you fast forward, and I'm making this stuff up, 98% of them are not successful. So you've been around for 20 years. You've done, you invested in companies, you work with scale-ups, and we'll touch, we'll get into that later. What do you think is is the reason behind that? Like, I mean, from a lemonade stain to, it didn't work out. Oh, um. But there's a few variables. I think the number one variable which constitutes a disproportionate percentage is luck. And there's research that looks into successful businesses and why, and luck is, is a driving component. Um, I, I chatted someone the other day who said there's only three ways to get rich. You're either born into a rich family, you get lucky, or you're criminal. That's very interesting. That's a very interesting perspective. That's, you know, I know a few people who, who de you know, debunk that gut concept um, and are, are very successful. I think the other variables are people are often innovating, which entails tremendous cost and risk that is underestimated. 
rather than taking a, a proven or existing pattern because as you know we live in a, in a universe of entropy where energy is, is constantly dissipating and there's just essentially a hell of a lot more ways to go wrong than there are ways to go right but people kind of if you if you to ask people to say oh there's probably one way to go right and five ways to go wrong it's probably more like there's one way to go right and there's like five million ways to go wrong um and i think it's very easy to go wrong you need the right to do the right things in the right order in the right sequence in the right time and that's very difficult if there's no manual or pattern um and i think people don't they're very fixated on a, on a fixed goal rather than the journey which is essentially very likely to end in, in if, if you're climbing mount everest and you've never done it before no one's ever done it before you know, the, the probability of death is, is probably very high up there on the cards. And people don't think about it like that when they're selling a business. I think that's some of the reasons. I also think there's a lack of skills, like hands-on pragmatic skills that the market, that the, there is demand and supply, and the market demands the skills, and people don't actually have the skills. Like um, being a software engineer. Now, if you're a good software engineer, it's very easy to find work and make money because the market has a, has a really large demand there. I think skills is another key factor. And I think it's a lot of, like lacking knowledge. I think not just, um, you know, some sort of skill, which is someone knowledge based and someone not knowledge based, like a craft. And I think not understanding foundations, foundational stuff, how a PNL works, how a balance sheet works, you know, how, what, what investment return alternatives there are for investors what the market looks like. Um, they don't maybe have enough meaningful relationships that they can leverage. Yeah, so there's a lot of variables to why and um, why failure is so much more common or prolific than success. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that, that how you started the answer because when I look at my career, it's been, so obviously with, with Whitebeard, I'm older, uh, 40 years in, in marketing and business. Um, I always tell people I learned how not to do things more than how to do things by in, in my own journey. And you watch, you, 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 you make my own mistakes and then you observe and watch other people's mistakes. And there's a lot to learn from, as you said, the how not to do things um, than chasing the ultimate hack. And, and we'll get into that term later on because uh, the, the word hack is sort of like attached to you. And I want to dive into it later on. So um, I noticed that you you had early in your career there was a three D animator. Yeah. Uh, so what was that about? Because that that's somewhat a departure from what you do today. That was my first job actually. Um, I was chatting to someone at MIRC, which was a Slack, twenty years ago, and um, he offered me an internship, and I flew over from Israel to London to work as a 3D animator, which was like my dream at the time. I think it was like 20 years old. Hmm. Um, and I couldn't find work. And I didn't know how to find work. And the retrospectively, like it's very clear, but um, it was very hard to find work back then. It was a, a nascent industry, a nascent category. And I didn't really have the skills or education to pull it off either. Um, so then, yeah, people took me under their wing and I developed a proficiency and aptitude in marketing. And, um, I remember I went for, for many job interviews and I remember one of some of the job interviews, the guy said that you, you failed the test. And I said, that's fine. I'll work for free for a week. And he's like, I'm sorry, you can't hire you. Oh, it's fine. I'll work for free for a month. Like, I'm sorry, I can't hire you. Okay. I'll work for free for three months. You know, give me an opportunity. I'll develop the skills. And he just said, wow, like, wow, you're so persistent. Um, I can't offer you the job, but you're going to be very successful with attitude. <laughs> and the truth is I kind of hustled and, and um, a bit of luck and a bit of help is how I kind of started off, I think. And people took a, they took risk on me. They saw, um, I think they saw someone who's like very ambitious and hungry and is willing to go all out, which I was. I was working harder than... Yeah, the people around. I remember the boss would come to me at 6 p.m. and he's like, you know, we're inside to go home now. And like, just a bit more, just a bit more, you know, I mean, like, you know, I really try to grasp the opportunity and um, both hands on the horn. And I got really great results because I, I really applied myself. Um, mm. 
yeah, which I've never stopped doing. Yeah. There's, uh, there's a guy in the US, and I'm, I'm sure he's well known all over the world. His name is Guy Raz, and he has a, a podcast I've been following for years called How I Built This, and sort of modeled mine after him. But I, I think he always ends his podcast with the same question. Uh, do you think it's luck or hard work? that contributed to your success and he only interviews people who are mega successful and um yeah the luck the luck aspect is always there but more often than not it's the hard work that you know it's sort of like a magical combination of when you work hard the luck piece with the, there's a timing aspect to when things just work right uh, if you're in the right place at the right time or your tech just happens to blow up and you were first out, whatever it might be, it's interesting that it's it's to come, it's it's like you started with luck. It's a like luck and and hard work, and you sort of embody uh sounds like the hard work piece is how you start, and then luck maybe comes later. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh the the universe works in mysterious ways. Um I don't think I, I said yeah, for me it's um to simplify, it's just probability, probabilistic theory. So if you take, a, if you're shooting into a basketball hoop, the more shots you take, the more probable that one of them is going to go in, and it's that simple. So, and I think people just don't understand, don't know what hoop, like what shot is going to get them in, and then they, it's hard to attribute. And it's just probabilistic. So the more you try over a long enough period, you're bound to be successful eventually at one thing. Right, and and if you read and know about the Michael Jordan of the world and the Tiger Woods, uh, when we see them perform, that's the the output of where everybody goes home after the game. You know, Michael Jordan stays around for three hours and, and does a three-point shot or foul shot. And Tiger Woods stays after 12 rounds of golf and continues to work on his drive, whatever it is. It's um, we, we all get fascinated by what we see, but we don't really recognize the hard work that leads to that level of performance which uh, i think we can we can talk about your own success in in the digital marketing space um we seem to share a love of psychology because you have an undergrad in it do you remember why you picked psychology as as a discipline um, i think i've always been kind of torn into entrepreneurship 3d kind of i guess creative expression and part of that subcategory in entrepreneurship is is the way people think the way the mind works and i think at the time when i started it i was undergoing a lot of therapy and self-development work which i kind of i've always done and i always probably will do it's kind of part of who i am i suppose and um, I wanted to go deeper and, and have a better understanding. And I think part of it was like an exploration potentially of, of go, going down the route of becoming a therapist and helping people. But interesting enough, during my psychology studies, the thing that I found most interesting was the biology of the brain. And I think there's something very concrete about it that... It's very tangible, where a lot of the other stuff felt very um, abstract or conceptual, like man-made frameworks that are not necessarily grounded in, in um, I don't know, hard, harder to, to prove, harder to evidence. So I, thought, I thought that was, yeah, that was an interesting experience. I mean, I enjoyed the other stuff, but I remember being really engaged and interested. It's almost like the, the part of me is like engineering that. I like to build stuff, and I like to create stuff, and I like to understand it how things impact each other and the, the brain as an engineering, as a, as a, as a function kind of fascinated me and still does. Hmm. Um, amazing. Cause, cause my attraction was, I think like yours have been to this day, I'm obsessed with the human brain. Um, and, and I remember when I was writing my papers in college, I always ended any essay or any, any project with uh, the day we, uncover the workings of the human brain is is the beginning and the end of civilization as we know it and you know this was this is years ago but it's the fascination of this thing that sits here and it is complex but yet 
uh, incredibly intriguing on when you watch human behavior and you make decision making, which is what we wind up doing as, as marketers anyway. I was uh, in the US finishing my undergrad, wanted to get a PhD in psychology, not to be a therapist, but to actually be what back then we called it industrial psychology. Today they call it organizational behavior, I think, yeah. is you know the impact of the environment on people's behavior. Um, I couldn't afford it. I had to work to support myself and I couldn't do a PhD. So I had to decline. And so I made a slight left turn and got an MBA in marketing, which to me, the two are always interconnected. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to read uh, a, sort of like another quote from you from 2004. So from 2004, not kind of quote, um, you've been immersed in digital marketing uh, SEO, PPC, 12,000 plus Google ad campaigns, websites, content development. Um, I mean, I always say that despite all the tech terms that, that we're accustomed to, mm -hmm. uh, there's a human behind each one of those, right? And mm -hmm. I think what I liked when I studied you before the, the our, our session today was that even though you're you're mastering the art and science of digital marketing, you still recognize that there are people that we're trying to connect with, sure. uh, and that's really the goal, right? Do, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, there's um, so it's a common debate that pops up in lots of marketing communities about the principles from the 1960s or 18th century, even. And it has has things have things really changed, and um, I think fundamentally it's like there's key aspects that are persistent in marketing principles, regardless of the medium. But there's so much nuance in the medium, and the audience, and the combination of the variables that needs to be treated as a unique set of variables or components. So yes, there are these kind of foundational things that are broad reaching, but not many of them. Mm -hmm. But it depends on the channel and the strategy as to whether or not it's person centric, interesting enough. So a person centric approach is one strategy, I'd say like a very common one that's applicable to most things, but it, but there are exceptions to how one approaches or thinks about it to get a result. Hmm. Um, so I did a stint for six years as a graduate marketing professor at, at a graduate school of business in New York City. And I, I think one of the most misunderstood, overused term by many people is the word strategy. And, yeah. and I think that from really studying you for at least a good few hours, um, I think you get it. And I think most people don't. People just throw the word strategy all over the place. Um, so 20 years in digital marketing. And, and again, the tools, I always tell people, the tools we use are just tools, okay? So you can get really good at, maximizing lowering C cost per acquisition on on adwords and that's whatever right we're not going to get techy but the piece that at least from my observation people tend to skip over and i call it like they want to run to the front of the line mm -hmm. it is really the most impactful piece of marketing that the smart people successful people do like you which is a strategy piece yeah. so so how do you explain strategy to an eight-year-old? Yeah, strategy is everything you don't do. <laughs> okay. Un un has, to very, has, to, has to be a smart eight-year-old. Um, unpack it. I think the problem is the misconception around marketing is foundationally the marketing is about broadcasting outward and reach as many people as possible. That's the foundational assumption, and it's erroneous. 
the better way to think about marketing is you need to find the right, like a combination, like the right combination on the right channel to the right audience. And you need to do that better than anyone else on that channel talking to that audience. So it's a very different paradigm. And the right strategy unlocks your ability to do that. But in order to unlock the strategy and do it, it requires a hyper focus. And it's counterintuitive because human beings, we want to diversify risk. So we invest in lots of different areas rather than go all in because it's very risky if you go all in and you lose everything. Mm -hmm. Interest, interesting enough, entrepreneurs, that's what they do. They run one business. They put all their eggs in one business and they obviously don't diversify risk by doing that. But then when it comes to marketing, because it's a domain they don't specialize in, they treat it like uh, just broadcasting. So then they end up producing, they get lost in a sea of sameness and they get lost in the, in the noise of very similar low quality content on, on very low effort, focus on how to really crack a channel but fundamentally, it's all about differentiation and how to be different. And to be different is actually, it's underestimated in its complexity because being different is easy. But being different in a way that is effective is really hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to be differentiated meaningfully. So strategy, I think where strategy gets confused is people think strategy is encompasses is like tactics deployed in a certain sequence at a certain time. And that's not quite right. But also people confuse strategy with a plan and that's not quite right either. So a strategy is a, it's a risk that one takes. It's, a, it's, a, it's an assumption, a hypothesis or a direction. That is, and, and the more studious one, one is for that audience and that channel, that message and that business, the more you understand the competitive landscape, the more the more easily you can identify opportunity to differentiate. Hmm. You know, it's a very interesting because most strategists, they talk a lot about, they take a lot of the learnings and inspiration from war and, and, and they see, they anchor strategy as a way to defeat an enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, in marketing, it's interesting because Typically, if you speak to a savvy marketer, they say that's not what you should do. And the reason is, if you're hyper-focusing on your competitor, you're either mimicking them or you're seeking inspiration from them. The key is to do the opposite, is to look at them as a group and how to differentiate from the herd. But the key is to connect to your audience. So not look at your competitors, look at your audience. So if you think about it, if the obsession is how to defeat your enemy, but your, enemy is, uh, your obsession with your enemy is what's going to lead you to failure, and you can see why there's such a misconception around marketing strategy. It's because the people who, who are proponents of strategy are applying these principles in a domain that it's not, it's not effective, it's not as applicable. I'm not saying the business strategy isn't the same, could be it is. Um, but saying that there are components of marketing that obviously you need to take that into account, like pricing. Pricing is an area that is particularly sensitive to, to competitive movement because of the way people shop around, because it's such a key consideration in a person's um, unlocking of value, right? Because anything we buy, service or, or product, is to, to meet an emotional need of some sort, to meet some sort of requirement that we have. And that journey of exploration, when you kind of look at how people buy or purchase, and then they curate a short list of options, Price is going to be one of those quite key criteria that people evaluate the, the best solution for them. Um, yeah, strategy is quite a complex topic. I'd say I haven't quite mastered uh, the, the understanding. I guess it's like this uh, martial art. You know, kind of the more as you go up higher and higher down up the thing, you you realize how little you know. So I, I don't feel that I have a good grasp over strategy. I'd probably do a competitive summary versus getting into marketing, though, having done it for so long. I think you did a great job touching on the different aspects of strategy, and we haven't quite solved it, which is what makes strategy so challenging, um, for sure. And and I I, I kind of like how you brought the Sansu art of war into this, because that's always been the Bible of strategists, including in marketing. 
And I think it's interesting that you point out that it's not about defeating the enemy. Uh, to me, the enemy is failure, not your competitors, right? So how do you develop a strategy that allows you to succeed? Yes, I'm obsessively supporting studying your competitors in order to learn what they do. But like you said, to identify and develop a way to differentiate yourself, not in order to beat them. And, and that's the key. At the end of the day, um, it, it does come down to when somebody looks at you, has to make a buying decision. Why should you buy? Why should they buy from you? Right. And I asked that question for, you know, my, my day job as a business coach and, and even my, my travels and talk to people and, and mentoring on growth mentor, which we were both part of. Mm -hmm. And my first question to a lot of the founders that I worked with, talked to it, I said, um, why should I buy from you? Just give me a reason. And they can't answer the question from a buyer perspective. They answer it from a tech guy, which leads me to my next piece. Um, I think we both got attracted to psychology and you seem to have picked the B2B space, the business to business, uh, sort of as a as, as your playground, uh, which has been, most of my career has been in B2B. And I think that's the... It's interesting because I was teaching graduate school and the dean of the undergraduate school of Tour University in New York asked me to come in and teach a class for the undergrad. And I said, sure, what do you want to teach? I said, I'm going to teach B2B marketing. And he said, no one has ever taught that. Don't you have something else? And I said, no, this is one of the one of these disciplines that doesn't get enough attention in academia. But yet, when you go outside, everybody is excited about, you know, consumer goods and and b2c mm. but for me b2b is where it's at it is complex mm. uh, it's not selling to a human being it's selling to an organization mm. to decision makers mm. that's your mm. space right and and you picked out of all b2bs and you tell me if i'm wrong or so correct me you're in a you're in a tech space that's sort of like your area right you call it scale ups in tech space so I do B2C and B2B. Okay. I've actually done more, technically I've done more B2C for about 12 years of my 20 year career, but technically a bit more B2C. The last eight years I've been doing both. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done both for organizations who do both. So I was touching on B2C and B2B in, in organizations who do both at the same time. Um, but all of, all of the ones I have in common, I'd say a tech businesses on the startup and scale up side, but not the corporates. And the corporates, it's been consumer facing and quite a lot of electronic manufacturers having done work like Samsung, Lenovo, and Canon, but also finance, like Investec Bank. And I'm just doing work for another bank now, actually. And I'm also doing work now for one of a very large telecom company, which is um, actually consumer facing. Actually, like an SME B2B, which is kind of more like B2C. So I've kind of, I've done, I've worked in quite a few industries now, probably about eight or nine industries with about 40 plus businesses. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking for one quote that I absolutely loved that uh, I extracted. Um, yeah, here we go. So it, it's the way you differentiate between working with corporations and startups, right? Yeah. Um, and you say, because of the political complexities the corporations have, which scale-ups don't suffer from, uh, if I was to sum it up, I think the biggest problem for corporation is internal coordination. And I'd say yeah. for scale-up, it's resource limitations. And yeah. and that's brilliant, right? So so the attractive part for me, uh, when I did, I did an internship with IBM in graduate school, and I knew I would never work for a large company. Right, like you, I'm an Israeli. We're not wired for political correctness. I would get in trouble every week and eventually maybe get fired. So I directed my career to small and medium sized, mostly small businesses, because it was a survival thing for me. I knew that if I was good in a small company, I would advance quickly. Not titles, but you know, from from a financial standpoint. Whereas my best friend worked for IBM, and that's how I got in was there for 15 years and and I surpassed his income in one year after my MBA compared to the 15 years he's been with IBM. And so I was impatient 
about climbing the ladder and having to play the game within large corporations. But specifically with marketing, your point is th there is a complexity of an organization. From my perspective, most of it's political, ego-driven stuff. Um, whereas with startups and scale-ups, uh, what limits them is resources. Yeah, I'd say corporates, there is, um, I've met people who are ego-driven and political. But I think the challenge they have is there's too many conflicting needs or requirements that are misaligned with a fight over finite resource. So I think my, my perspective of corporates has slightly changed since that quote. But I'd still say a lot of people I met fall into that category. But with scale-ups, absolutely, the biggest issue is... Um, is a resource shortage for the market the most part. It's not, yeah, it's all about how to be as effective as possible with the resources that people have. And I think with all of the companies, there's the wastage is, is tremendous. There's a massive amount of wastage of, of talent and time and energy by doing too much and doing the wrong things. At an alarming rate, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a quite um, disheartening. But I think it's also part of the process. You know, like our our brain takes up twenty five percent of all the calories we consume. But really, the brain is there to sort of function for the rest of the organism, right? So, in a way, it's like you know. So when we consume calories, I think like ten or fifteen percent is the digestive system consuming the calories itself. Like part of the process of the engine is what the engine just maintaining the engine. I think it's just part and parcel of this of the experience these companies are going on their own journey towards achieving their goals. It's this wastage. Mm -hmm. Some of them are horrifically, horrifically ineffective and horrifically inefficient though. Some of them, like the bigger they are, the worse it is. Yeah. And and I think the other thing that I found, and you know more than that than, than me, is that uh, th there's a lot less risk taking in corporations that you'd find with scale ups because you are you you want to be a conformist, right? You want to do the right thing and follow the follow the, the tribe. Uh, I mean, there are reasons why you want to differentiate yourself internally in the corporate world, but people are not taking risks because if you make a mistake, the impact is much larger. Whereas in the scale ups and entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurial journeys, uh, if they have even with limited resources, if you can convince them to take the risk because they're doing the right thing they will be successful, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, not necessarily, unfortunately. I think, uh, <laughs> I, I wish I had the magic formula for success. Um, I think they're more likely to gain a faster learning. And I think the faster learnings over a long enough period of time increases the probability of success. <clears throat> Well, I sell an increased probability of success, not success itself, because I can't guarantee that. Otherwise, everything I do would be performance based, which it isn't. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's a kind of a key a key point um, to make. With risk, I think that a lot of the people I personally worked with in corporates who pulled me in, they are entrepreneurs by heart, and they are less risk averse than the average. But all the people around them in the organization, a lot of them tend to be risk averse. So, personally, the people who tend to pull me in. The reason they put me in as a consultant is because of the mentality. I think it summed up, someone said it to me the other day, you eat what you kill. And they pull me in because as a consultant, they I'm not comfortable like some of the people in the organization have been there for a very long time or are just kind of clocking in and clocking out and, and they're not really looking to have a major impact. They're kind of quietly mm -hmm. floating along. So, but yeah. And now having worked with quite a few and, and quite, yeah, some of them are incredibly, um, have a, a very strong stomach for risk. Others are scared shitless. It's very varied. Mm -hmm. So your your company, the one you've, you've had for a while called Curve, K-U-R-V-E, uh -huh. which is a, um, if I simplify it, you're basically a, a digital marketing agency. Is that a good way to define it? 
consultancy agency hybrid. So we're a partner model and operating like a law firm. I think I'm one of the only ones in the UK with this model that I created about I think, two or three years ago. It's quite mm-hmm. still an exper- experimental phase. It's working quite well. You know, we've got some clients that are number one in their category on the app store. Like one of them, we got them to a billion users. It's like one of the largest mobile apps in the world. Um, so we have some pretty sizable clients that we work with now um, on the consumer side. And then some of the partners, they're consultants and they're very specialized. So for example, one of them just does um, positioning for B2B SaaS businesses, mm-hmm. kind of between the seed and B round. Another just does uh, go-to-market demand generation and account-based marketing for B2B SaaS. So different partners have different specializations and their teams and their own kind of service areas. And they're, they're run, it's quite an unusual model in the fact that we're all, it's egalitarian and it's holographic. So everything is purely transparent and everything's voting based. So it's more like a round table than a hierarchy. Mm-hmm. And um, it works well for this model, this, this kind of modality, this framework. Yeah, and, and I kind of loved how you, how transparent you are, but but I think, and it's, I think it's the way you differentiate, your strategy of differentiation is uh, by showing the special, the, the people in your, on your team who are specializing in certain things. And for me, I'm not a big fan of agencies to begin with, because I worked for one in Israel many years ago, and it's all about revenue and whatever, it's fine. Uh, but to me, the, the most effective agencies one like yours or i kind of call them the navy seals of marketing where there's a team each one is a specialist one could be an explosive one is a sniper uh but the team together goes out and and complete the mission successfully and and i kind of i really like the way you present it um the question i have for you and that's it's a term that i always run away from uh, I, I'm, I call myself a transformational business coach, whatever the heck that means. But consultancy, people always say to me, "Are you a consultant?" And I, I shudder because yeah. I think part of it, part of it is my own PTSD in my corporate career. I've thrown yeah. consultants out of my office because they were just useless. They, they had a golden resume. They worked for one or two famous companies, and then they used that to walk around with the same templated Word document and pretend to know stuff so but so how do you define consultancy from from your perspective yeah i think the main difference between an agency model is with an agency you effectively have hierarchies of of talent and skill and you can either do it by age actually so you kind of have your your younger ones who are at the bottom and they're kind of doing the grind you got the people that are of the project managers, and then you've got the kind of business development and sales and strategy. So kind of three layers. With a consultant, you're not getting the tactical delivery component. You're not getting someone who's like a specialist in, in Google Ads mm-hmm. or specific. You're getting someone who's more, they're solving problems. So it's very different when you think there's a problem, a complex problem that requires brain power and persistence to solve versus a plumber who's just, you know, doing the day-to-day plumbing work and can only do the most common plumbing problems on the top breaks. But if you have a specialist problem or deeper, more complex problem, which many businesses obviously do because they have multiple people and multiple systems, there's a lot more complexity than a simple plumbing system. It requires a more, a deeper, it requires more brain power. You require someone of a certain um, mental caliber in terms of their IQ, but also experience to, to have a breakthrough with that problem. But agencies are not good at solving complex problems because everything they do is standardized. So they're very good at standardized problems and a cost-effective way and a delivery engine that's kind of perfecting that specific thing. A consultant is more versatile, more holistic, but typically... We'll walk you through how to solve the problem and maybe even help you find the problem who can, the people who can unlock tactically to deliver, but most of them won't do the actual work required. And that's what bothers people because like, if you have an architect and he gives you an amazing plan, but he's not doing your painting and plastering and plumbing and electricity, that's not surprising because we know what an architect does. But with a consultant, you don't have the same paradigm that it's an architect you have the paradigm that it's a, a, an all-in-one 
person, but like if you have any experience, you realize no one who's a really great plumber is also a great electrician and a great plaster, and, and, and you know, it's not possible. So that's the problem with consultants and consultancies. I also think the way traditional consultancies deliver solutions through standardized playbooks to a non-savvy buyer, and they leverage their brand to sell something to a buyer who's looking for a solution, but, but doesn't actually materially solve the problem deep, because it doesn't go deep enough, or it's not tailored enough, is part of what contributes to poor reputation. Um, you know, one of the, my clients, which is a, is a very large organization, 10,000 employees, I remember the person who hired me, she said, yeah, I could go to, to a top consultancy firm, but I don't really see a reason why should I be paying that premium? So for, for that person, she didn't see the value in the price tag. So she wanted to opt for a smaller independent outfit. Um, you know, it's like this adage around um, buying IBM. No one got fired for buying IBM. No one gets fired for choosing a McKinsey or a Deloitte um, because they're meant to be, you're buying a certain, a, a premium quality of standard. And... It depends on kind of what the buyer is looking for. Are they a value-based buyer? Are they looking to just safeguard? Are they too busy and they just went to outsource the, the problem, which is very, very rarely, that's a problem. The problem here is a lot of problems companies have are internal and they're outsourcing, solving an internal problem to an external vendor. And the external vendor isn't really able to operate within. And I've had that myself where I've been pulled into a very large organization and I was unable to deliver an effective solution, which is very frustrating because I wasn't able to infiltrate the organization because I wasn't part of it. And they only regard you if you're one of them. So mm -hmm. it was immovable that I couldn't, I couldn't break the barrier. And I tried for a long time to break it and I didn't deliver a result, which is very frustrating and obviously frustrating for the client. And then we both tried our best to make it work, but it just uh, didn't happen. And that's the problem with consultancies and why there's so much frustration. Uh, some of the problems, there's other reasons as well, but you know, it's a very long conversation. There's some of the ones I've identified or observed. Hmm. Fascinating. I know we have a hard stop in, in a couple of minutes, so I want to um, uh, run through. We've got tons of questions here. Um, let, let, let me go to the end so I don't miss this stuff. Um, sure. You, you said that you discovered meditation, which is also seems to be common thread among successful people that I interview for sure. Um, what does meditation do for you? I mean, for me, it's, I, I, I don't do it. I, I want to explore it, but um, what is it doing for you? There's this quote from a, a monk who was asked this question. He says, um, when I wake up and I walk out my front door and I'm going to wherever I'm going, the meditation facilitates the awareness to observe the flowers on my my doorstep and to just admire them for a moment before I continue on my journey. Hmm. And I, yeah, so that's like a nice, you know, very Zen-like answer to the question, um, which is all nice and, and great, but for people having experienced meditation, it's hard to relate or understand that. So I'd like to kind of break it down to something more pragmatic. We have finite time and we have finite energy, but we also have finite willpower. And we can call this concentration or focus. And concentration or focus power is a muscle that you can train. Meditation is effectively a focus training exercise. And it allows the possibility to move from a reactive state, which is biological or instinctual, to respond to stimuli through dopamine and cortisol and a, a flight, a fight, or, or freeze response, to a to activate in the frontal lobe, which enables you to access more creative ways to observe and experience the stimuli, and you move from reactive to responsive, and. That's kind of the, the pragmatic biological answer. On a personal note, 
it makes uh, I, the, the benefit to me is that I'm calmer. I have more clarity of thought. I do less, but what I do is more meaningful and more impactful because I put more energy into more complex or harder things. I'm overall happier. And probably most importantly, I'm more loving and compassionate to those in my life and those are around me. So I'm, I'm kinder to myself and to others. But for me, meditation is, a, it's a, it was a transformative experience um, because for me, the, the point of, of the turning point was doing a Vipassana 10 day Sala meditation retreat in the Himalayas. And that unlocked an experience for me. It unlocked something in me that um, one of the most cherished experiences I've had, one of the, probably one of the, mo one of the most transformative experiences I've had personally. So for me, it was in, in mean, materially uh, meaningful in, in improving my life quality in, in lots of areas. Um, it's a yeah, topic I'm passionate about. I have a lot of love. There's a book, um, the Tao, and he he started a monk in, in Greece wrote it, he translated it, and he starts by the book by saying, "Oh beloved Tao, and I hope I you do, do you justice in trying to describe you in this book." And he's talking about an, an inanimate force. He's talking about you know you can translate it in lots of ways, a god, or universe, or whatever the forces are that he believes governs life, a, a subtlety and energy. And he, the love and appreciation, it kind of comes off, it pops off the page, this, this deep, deep, um, deep relationship he has with this, this experience, this thing that he perceives. Um, and I'd like to hope that I, I have a similar love or affection for, for meditation, for essentially for being, for nurturing, Balancing in the 1960s, they developed a theory of being versus doing. And in many ways, meditation fosters being rather than doing. And, and my natural um, predisposition is, is excessive doing, being mm -hmm. an entrepreneur and being a business owner and, and you know, having worked in, in very intense work environments with very material challenges that are very complex and difficult with very difficult people. Um, put myself in this situation so immense challenges which are you know wonderful and, and, and but also very taxing you know, i pay a price for it so the being is a very important aspect and the balance helps me balance out the energy uh, doing and the being um, yeah, so that's a, an attempt to answer that question the truth is it's a it's a question that can't be answered because it's experiential and it's, I remember there was a book I was reading and I read the book six times and never always got halfway through and kept starting again. And I did my meditation retreat and I finished the book in, in two and a half hours. And once I finished reading it, I was like, oh, that was so simple. And I couldn't fathom before the, the experience why I couldn't understand the book. And the problem is we're thinking so much with our brain, trying to understand concepts. But go and explain to an eight-year-old what love is into using words, verbal language. But you know, if you look at Sapia Wolf theory and linguistics, and Noam Chomsky, language is a, is a container. And to try and always capture the essence of something in a container, it just doesn't work. It's like to try and put things into a bucket and use a bucket as an explanation for the things in the bucket, you're always going to be chasing your tail because a bucket and what's the, the inside the bucket are not the same thing. But language and uh, the way that we think, because we are reality is formulated through language, but people don't really re know this, not common knowledge to know this. And um, by experiences, uh, uh, a physical, emotional, mental experience. So an encapsulating beyond the cognitive, beyond the verbal, beyond just the mind, into the physical, into the emotional, into the mental, the synergy of something that connects all of those systems together creates an experience. And one must experience it to really um, fully acknowledge its, um, its utility and value. And I, I think I want to end it on this beautiful note, Owen, because you, you described something that's personal to you and, and you can tell by your body language how you, you actually got excited talking about it. But to, to bring it back to the beginning, you, you sort of described to me what marketing is all about because that's something that we love, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. the experiential aspect of you, we're dealing with human beings 
right? So inside the bucket or the funnel, they're actually breathing, living human beings. And if you do marketing the right way, at least from my perspective, and it's hard work, uh, you're able to connect with them in a unique way. It's not easy, uh, but if you if you understand, re- for me, if you understand marketing, that it's about human behavior and the experiential piece of why do people pick you and not someone else, then you you can be successful. But I, I love, I, I want to end it on a meditation piece because it's, it, it was beautiful, especially the walk out the door and appreciate the flowers outside, which we seem to always walk by. Wow. Um, and I want to end it on this and I will try and grab you for another one in the future because there's so many more questions I had for you uh, about marketing and digital marketing, but we'll leave that because you you ended it for me on a beautiful note. So thank you again for spending some time with me. It's been incredible. And um, if anybody wants to connect with Oren, you'll find him in my show notes. But if you go to Oren Greenberg on LinkedIn, there's only one. On YouTube, I found some kid somewhere who's not you, but most of it is you. So you can you can look up Oren on YouTube, uh, including a DJ session, which I thought it was you, but I couldn't tell. It was so dark. No, no. That wasn't no DJ. Okay, that's not him. Okay, see, all right. So most of it is you. Maybe, maybe, right. maybe on the dance floor. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. All right. Thanks again. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, and we'll stay in touch. Thank That's you. Fine. Thanks. Okay.